the next part of the presentation, which is turning to the uh, content of the, 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 the actual budget itself. Um, as in the past, I'm going to be looking at three principal areas. I'm going to look at the area of personal tax, some of the company tax, and then looking at some cars. So on that basis, um, you'll also hear me saying at times a little bit like, um, like, like Chris Whitty by saying next slide, and I appreciate that we're doing this in multiple locations at the moment. And uh, so uh, you will hear some opportunity to say next slide, please. So uh, Carol, if we want to just now enter the presentation, we'll deal with personal taxation. There's been a lot of headline talk about personal taxation and really driven by if there's to get out of this pandemic, who should pay for this coming out of it? And uh, for many people, personal taxation was one area that was suggested. Indeed, there were many suggestions of how the, the pandemic would be paid for. But in terms of the actual personal taxation, um, actually in the budget, there was no real major changes. If we look at the personal allowances, that, uh, which is set by the UK government. So if you see a, a Union Jack, you realise that's because it's set by the UK government. And from time to time, you'll see a, a Scottish flag, and that's because it relates to tax delivered and set by the, the Scottish government. So the personal allowance was £12,500. It's going to be increased to £12,570. That's a whopping increase of £70. Um, but the, probably the headline one, which the, the newspapers latched onto, was freezing of the personal allowance till 2026. Will just through the natural passage of time that as people's increase in income happens, then more and more people will fall into the, the tax regime, perhaps for the first time for many years, um, frozen until 2026. And that's probably one of those classic ones that Alan Mitchell refers to as the, as the increase in the tax by doing nothing, by just freezing you know, allowances. So they have been, the personal allowance has been set to be frozen until 2026. The UK government also can set, the for, it, for the rest of the UK, when you become a, a higher rate taxpayer. The UK has set that at previous a level of 37,500 was last year, which gave a very nice, uh, easy to remember that in the, the England, Wales and Northern Ireland, you became, you became a higher rate taxpayer at £50,000, being the 37,500 um, basic rate band and the 12,500 personal allowance. There was also a very modest increase of £200 in that band as well. So for the rest of the UK, so that's not in Scotland, then we're now seeing a, a, a basic rate band the, the level we have to become a higher rate taxpayer is now 50,270. But as I said, that's not true of Scotland. So let's just remind ourselves what the rates are in Scotland. Uh, Scotland has got a, a, a much more uh, varied rates of tax. We have a starter rate of 19%. We have the basic rate of 20, an intermediate rate of 21, a higher rate tax of 41% before becoming a top rate of 46%. Um, and if the, if the ease of the, the rest of the UK system was to remember the numbers because they were all in round thousands, that's not true of the, the rates in Scotland where we have the snappy um, level of the start rate going up to 14,667. That trips off the tongue. And similarly, all of the rest of the numbers, partly due to just increasing them in line with inflation. But it does mean that you then get very strange sounding numbers for the, for the personal tax rates. It would be helpful if these were even rounded to, to two decimal points, but maybe that's just a, a challenge. So if that's what the, the rates are in Scotland, then does that, what are the actual marginal rates? What rates of tax do people pay? Well, of course, this gets confusing now because you've got this interface between what the tax rates are, which are in the middle column you see before you, but also the fact that the way the national insurance is levied, that in England, the national insurance falls to the 2% rate when you become a higher rate taxpayer. Um, that's also true in Scotland, but of course, you become a higher rate taxpayer in Scotland at a lower level than the rest of the UK, which means we've got this series of marginal rates of taxes, which seem to rise from 33 to 53. Then it drops down again when everybody's paying the 2%. And then, of course, there's this trap, which those who've been at previous Tom's Weaver seminars will know that I often refer to this tax trap between 100 and 125,140, where you actually have a very high marginal rate of tax. And the reason it's so high in that band is because that's when you start to lose the personal allowance, whether you're in Scotland 
or in the rest of the UK. And so we've got many clients who speak to us about how can they take steps to avoid being caught in that very nasty tax trap of 61% tax. So what is the then difference between a, 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 a Scottish taxpayer and an English taxpayer when they're, they're just in that level between the, you know, how much does these different taxes actually mean to what your take home pay actually becomes? Well, if we go forward, or as Professor Whitty would say, next slide, please, thank you. Then a, a Scottish taxpayer with an earned income of 50,270 will have a higher tax bill of 1,550 than their equivalent uh, co-worker it could even be if you're in a UK employer with Scottish and other UK employees, uh, an additional tax liability of £1,550. Whereas if you go right up to the highest rate where you're just below becoming a, the 150000 then at the worst extreme, then a Scottish taxpayer would have a tax bill £2,673 higher than their equivalent um, uh, English, Welsh and Northern Ireland um, taxpayer. Um, but remember, the Scottish government, it's only on the earned income from employment and self-employment that these relate to. So in fact, you only have income from investment income, then your tax liability is exactly the same as the, as the rest of the UK. Um, many of our clients are in a situation of receiving dividends. So I'm just going to give you a, a brief reminder of how the tax system works on people who are in receipt of dividends. Uh, when the tax and dividends changed a number of years ago, there was a, an introductory band which was much more generous of how much you could al you're allowed to receive in dividends without paying any tax. That was reduced to £2,000 in April 2018, and it's remained frozen ever since. And that's really so that taxpayers have got very small portfolios of a modest number of shares, perhaps some that they just inherited or some that they got when companies were demutualized many years ago. But they've got very modest dividends, and to stop them having to complete tax returns, this 2000 band is there for that. Uh, some accountants still use that as a tax planning opportunity, even in small private companies. And thereafter, dividends are then taxed at various rates of 7.5% if you're an ordinary rate, 32.5% if you're an upper rate taxpayer, and 38.1% if your income, total income is more than 150,000. So that's an update on dividends. Um, as Alan will point out later, if income tax is a, a whopping contributor to the, to the budget, then the next one in terms of size is national insurance. So I'll just touch on briefly on one or two changes that have affected national insurance. But the, the key message in national insurance is as seen as follows. Um, we look forward, you'll see that for national insurance contributions, really it was steady as she goes. There were, uh, for the bands when you started paying national insurance, there were just small inflationary increase in those bands. But the actual rates of national insurance, whether it was for the self-employed or employees, remained unchanged during the course of the year. For those of you who are employers, then of course there's an important employment allowance that's given you've still got time to do it for the tax year that we're in right now, then there is a relief available to you to reduce your national insurance bill. It's a relief of up to, and I think we should hopefully get that screen up in a second, but it's a, a relief of up to £4,000. So what this basically does is when you run the payroll, then you can get credit for the first £4,000 of your employer's national insurance bill. Um, there are a number of uh, significant restrictions on that. First of all, you can't do it if you're a company and you're the only employee of it. So that's the very bottom end that you don't get this £4,000 relief. And likewise, you don't get this relief if you're a large company and your employer's national insurance bill in the previous year was, um, was, was over £100,000. So but if you fall between those two bands, then just double check with your payroll department that they have indeed made the claim for the £4,000 employment allowance. Because if you haven't run the March payroll yet, then you could do it then and get the credit in your uh, March payroll run before you make your next payment. So that was the, 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 the really only changes that there were for employment loans. And I, I really wanted then to touch on some of the other areas. And one of the areas I, I spoke to my tax people was to talk about the, the green lobby. Um, auditors don't have a good reputation for being particularly inspiring or creative, uh, but tax people, their reputation has been literal. So I, I spoke to the tax department and said, can you give me an example of a green car? Uh, and this is what they sent me. Uh, I say, sometimes, tax people just take things a bit too literally. But I'd have to say it's a particularly attractive green car. 
But what I was really trying to get at was the question about uh, uh, are there certain tax advantages now when looking to buy a car, whether it's a company car or even a personal level? So the first car that I put down here was just an example of a, of a, of a modest car at, at, at a list price of £30,000 in Nissan Leaf. And they are very attractive in terms of your employees and the benefit and kind that attaches to it. So with a, despite having a list price of nearly £30,000, for the next year, a 1% benefit in kind is a tax charge or a benefit in kind of only under £300, which you then apply to the tax rate that you pay to that. So you can see that it's a quite a modest sum. The following year, it's going to be 2%, so effectively a doubling. And at one stage, it was anticipated this would go 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, and creeping up. But actually, what they've now said is that they're not telling us now what the rates are beyond 2023. Now, that's got a challenge, um, that, you know, because it means you've got to make the commitment to buy the car not knowing what the benefit in kind might be in year three or four of its ownership. And if we look at a, a larger car, um, I think the example that I've been given is of a, a Tesla Model S, one up to a £62,000 car, then you can see that 1% is 623 and in the following year it got up to 1247 But again, if you go out in the current year and choose to buy, or you even go into a, you know, a, a, a rental agreement um, for a car which is maybe tied in for three or four years, you'll have made that commitment without really knowing what the tax liability will be in the third or the fourth year that you might choose to own that car. So, uh, you know, a, a, a bit of guesswork still required, and, and maybe one of that guesswork involves you asking the question, do you think the Chancellor will need more money in the future? Um, who knows? What, and that, that's a political answer to that question. Compa let's compare that with just the traditional cars, which people have got company cars, um, but instead of taking a company car, they've actually just chosen to own their own car, and uh, but don't take the company providing the fuel. They simply claim an allowance of uh, a pence per mile for using of a company car. Um, for those um, individuals choosing to do that, then the amount of uh, you can claim from your employer varies depending on the size of your car. So if it's a small car under 1400 cc and it's petrol, you can claim 10 pence a mile as part of your expenses claim, rising to 12 um, for a 1400 to 2 litre car or 11 if it's diesel. If it's a over 2, th two litre car, 18 pence and a diesel 12. And you'll see also there, but if you're actually, um, the company provides you with a, a company car, which is electric, then you can still claim four pence per mile, um, presumably to reimburse you for the cost of you charging up your car. Although there are still very many free charging points around the UK, but that's a four pence a mile that you can claim. People have often also decided because of the car benefit scheme, not to even bother having a company car at all and just simply take a salary and provide their own car. And for those people, they use this fixed profit car scheme well, again, those 45 pence for the first 10,000 business miles have been unchanged for many years, and there's no change again next year. And likewise, once you do more than 10,000 business miles, it drops to 25 pence. But remember, you get that rate even if you've provided your, um, if you've bought your, decided to buy your, an electric car, that you would still be able to claim 45 pence a mile. So if you, rel if you bought a relatively modest electric car in your own name, and you've got a very high level of business mileage, then you can see that the cost of your electricity might be very small in relation to claiming 45 and 25 pence a mile. So again, we'll see more employees with high business miles, but the range of the car now enables them to carry all the duties that only the future will hold out for that. But employers can also help you know, their employees in a number of ways. And, uh, you know, so where you're deciding to, that uh, electric cars are, are the thing of the future, some employers are now looking to install charging facilities on their premises. And if you choose to install premises on your car, then the good news is that if employees make use of these charging points, then there's no, there, these are exempt from the need to disclose that and appeal and be benefit in kind. So again, you could have an employer who's got a, a, a distance to work, so they charge their car at their home, they then charge their car before they make their deliveries or whatever else, and no benefit in kind. So long as the charging facilities are at the premises, that doesn't apply where you put the, 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 the charging station at the home of your employee. Um, that, that, that doesn't apply to that. 
And also, if you do put a charging station at your office, then you'll get a 100% capital allowance deduction on it, even if you've exceeded all the rest of the thresholds. So that's on the car front, but we've also seen some significant changes in the world of, of vans. And, uh, and increasingly, you'll be seeing lots of people now making the option to take a, a, a van. Now, for the year which is just about to end, if you had a company van, uh, then it was a potential benefit in kind of just about three and a half thousand pounds, right? And then going up, sorry, 2,792 pounds, but going up next year, yeah, to, to three and a half thousand pounds. But if you chose instead to make that car an electric van that you provide to your employee, then there is no benefit in kind at all. So uh, you can see that many companies will think a small van's a, very tax efficient, B, they are um, very good for the, um, the CO2 emissions and therefore good for the green lobby. Uh, and thirdly, they also are very good for carrying advertising of your company and its product. So maybe we'll see an increasing run of people making a move to electric vans for the tax advantage of the company, full relief against your profits, no benefit in kind to your employee. Is that enough of a win-win situation to encourage employers to look to providing company vans? Moving on then to the area of, of corporation tax. Um, again, one of the, the headline movements here in the world of corporation tax was the, 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 the setting of the new rate of um, the 25%, albeit not for a couple of years time. So we've got a current rate of 19% for the next couple of years. That 19% will continue to apply to companies with very small profits up to 50,000 and then a 25,000 pound band thereafter. And between 50 and 250, we've got the return of the good old tapering arrangement, where actually if your profits are stuck between that band, the effective tax rate in between is about 26 and a half percent. It's also cheered our tax department up because it's a return to a uh, more complicated rules of how many companies are you associated with to determine what profits you are. In terms of another important area, which um, I know many of our clients have been looking at, is this question of claiming tax relief for when you're engaging in research and development. Um, the actual rates for the credits are still staying the same, that you get enhanced relief up to 230% if you're an SME. If it creates a loss that you want to surrender that loss and get the money back, then you get it surrendered at the rate of 14.5%. But uh, an important announcement in the budget was a, a restriction as to the ability to claim that credit. Um, there was a restriction when R&D first came in many years ago, but from the 1st of April 21, there's going to be a restriction to £20,000 plus three times the company's total PAYE and tax and national insurance liability for the year. And we already know some of our clients will be caught and that will restrict their ability to make a claim going forward. Clearly, with the economy being in some degree of difficult moment, the chances are fully expect some companies in the year which is about to end and for next year could actually be incurring trading losses. And as a result, a new relief has been introduced that whereas in the past you could only carry a loss back one year, companies with losses and indeed unincorporated business can actually carry that loss back three years. And that could be a very important relief for many people with cash flow difficulties over the next period of two years. Um, and of course, that can be linked with the, the ability to then carry that and to change. So if we, if we move forward, we can actually see that there, there, there are tax planning opportunities that will come to in a second as to how we, we make best use of that loss relief. But before I do that, I just want to touch upon another area which is changing, which is the area of capital allowances. Capital allowances is a, you know, a, a way in which companies can claim tax relief on capital expenditure. And one of the big allowances that everybody's been trying to get a hold of is a £1 million annual investment allowance. It was introduced on a temporary basis, uh, and rather unusually, it's now in its third year. So temporary in the world of tax is always uh, it's subject to chancellor interpretation. But there's, So that's been extended to the end of the year. And then the general rule of an 18% writing down allowance and a 6% relief on integral fixtures and fittings, uh, that's not changed. Um, so, so how does that actually work then in, in practice? So we've got a, a, a new thing to add to that um, allowance, which is this one that the Chancellor referred to as a super deduction. So this is where you spend money on assets that would normally qualify for just writing down allowances, whether it's the 18% or the 6%, that you can actually claim 130% tax relief 
on that writing down allowance or 50% on items qualifying for integral fixtures and fittings. Um, and where accountants start to get excited is when you start trying to, to combine these. So, so let's look at how you might get some tax relief if you combine them. But just a reminder that the super deduction, in this case, only companies, so sorry if you're a partnership or a sole trader, only if it's a new item that you buy, uh, so you can't buy it in second, you can't get the relief on second hand equipment. And if you buy a new asset, there are special rules to stop you just selling it the following week. So if you have a disposal, then the, the, the proceeds you get are multiplied by 1.3 as well. Clearly the Chancellor's already anticipating some people would have taken steps to, to abuse that new regime. So again, going forward, we then see the, the how do we then say other ways in which we can get this ability to claim losses and claim this capital allowances using the super deduction scheme and, and use some clever tax planning to do both. So as an example there, thinking of a company over the next 12 months, it's still coming out of lockdown, it's still got some cost to get started up, still building up its activity, and it's got a loss next year of £100,000. But as part of the next 12 months, it goes out and invests £250,000 on new plant and machinery. What, how can we make use of that by combining these two things into one tax planning opportunity? Well, if we combine them both, we look forward, you can see on the next slide, a, a nice simple example there. So but this company I've referred to, it's made a hundred thousand pound loss over the next 12 months. It's got this ability to claim capital allowances, not on 250,000, but on 325,000 because of the extension. So it's now got a loss of 425,000 pounds then it can either carry it back to 2019-20, that's the normal rule, but it could actually go back to the previous years, perhaps pre-COVID-19, when it had much larger profits, and in the following year, generate a tax repayment of £80,750. So, so the message that we say to our clients, if you are planning capital expenditure, right, don't plan it simply because it will reduce tax. But if you've got capital expenditure plans for the next two years, speak to your tax accountant first, because it could make an enormous difference to your tax liability and how you get the tax relief on it by planning when that expenditure falls. And uh, so lots of tax planning opportunities still that lie before us, but perhaps there are even more tax planning opportunities to follow in the areas of some of the other taxes. And so on that basis, what I'd now like to do is to hand over to, to my partner, Alan Mitchell, who'll take us through some of the other tax changes which affected those other aspects of tax announced by the Chancellor. So, so, so Alan, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and, and as Andrew said, um, this budget was all about supporting and helping business survive COVID-19 uh, pandemic and hopefully the opportunity to thrive as we come out of lockdown. Um, the tax changes were limited in this budget, but there was a clear message from Mr Sunak this was going to have to be paid for at some point. Um, so it's worth probably starting off by looking at how big is the problem? How big is the debt? Well, the OBR, the uh, Office of Budget Responsibility, uh, have advised that they expect by April 2021 um, that we'll be looking at a fiscal deficit for this year of £400 billion. Pounds. Putting that into context, uh, when the, the Tory party had their uh, budget uh, last uh, March, before the pandemic started, the expectation was that the deficit would only be £55 billion, and um, so a significant variance there. Where's the money all gone? Well, there's almost £77 billion has gone on the furlough scheme, um, about £66 billion has gone on the various loans and grants that have been handed out over this period, and obviously the NHS and public sector uh, have required significant additional funds to be able to cope with what's been thrown at them over the last few months. Um, and also there's the drop off in economic activity, so therefore tax revenue has reduced, um, which was contributed to that deficit. So all of this begs the question, how is Mr Sunak going to repay this debt? Um, so the, the routes in traditional format are shown in the next slide. 
This is where the money traditionally comes from. Uh, and as Andrew already mentioned, income tax, national insurance and VAT are the big contributors to uh, the Treasury's purse in any one year. Um, but the problem we have here is the 2019 Tory manifesto, which said that during the life of this parliament, um, they would not increase the rates of tax on these three heads of taxation. So bit of a problem and a challenge for Mr Sunak there to keep faith with the Tory party and the followers and square the budget. So the first poll that I would like you to participate in uh, is imagine you're Ricky Sunak, the Chancellor, which taxes would you choose to start uh, to collect to re repay this deficit? Okay, so as you're completing that, I'll, I'll move on. Um, firstly, uh, what I'd like to do is look at some of the COVID support measures uh, that have been introduced in this budget before um, we move on to any tax changes. So if we can see the next slide. Thank you. Um, so outside of grants and loans, the main support mechanisms uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic have been the coronavirus job support scheme and the self-employed income support schemes. Both, those of, both of these have been tremendously uh, successful in preserving jobs and businesses, uh, uh, allowing them to survive uh, uh, and, and cope with the pandemic. The, the CGRS, uh, or the furlough scheme, as it has become known, uh, is estimated to save over, has saved over 340,000 jobs uh, over the pandemic period. Um, and although the, the pandemic is not anticipated to, sorry, sorry, the lockdown is not anticipated to end until June, the Chancellor has decided in this budget to extend the furlough scheme until September uh, of this year. Um, and this slide shows the details of the extension. Um, it will continue at 80% of the wages to be paid until that date. Um, there is one change in that any employees who were on the payroll uh, as from the 2nd of March 2021 will now be eligible for uh, the furlough scheme. Previously, it was into last year that they had to be on the payroll, payroll uh, to be eligible for that. So any new starts since the new year will now be eligible to fall into the furlough scheme. The one change is really the unwinding of the furlough scheme. Similar arrangements to what were put in place last year, where the employer has to start to contribute towards the wage cost of the employee, starting off at 10% uh, of the salary in July uh, and increasing to 20% in August and September. And obviously, um, the employer has to contribute towards the national insurance and the pension costs of the full salary paid to the employees. Um, one thing to bear in mind though, the HMR revenue announced on budget date that they were recruiting another 1,200 new members of staff who are going to be appointed to investigate the furlough scheme fraud and errors. Um, so the revenue are well aware that there are instances there where there have been fraud um, and, and also uh, miscalculations. So it could well be that um, over the coming uh, years, we see the revenue reviewing furlough grant claims uh, in detail. Um, so one to bear in mind when you're reviewing your calculations. The second support um, offered by Mr Sunak is the extension of the self-employed income support scheme. Um, we've had three quarters of grants under this, uh, this scheme. Uh, the grant equated to 80% uh, of your average profits in the previous tax year. Um, so for the three grants so far, these were averaged uh, of profits in the year to. 2018-19, um, and they were capped at a maximum of £7,500 uh, as a quarterly grant. Um, they, they've now extended this into a fourth grant, um, and if you're entitled to this grant, um, you will receive notification in mid-April, um, where it will give you a personal claim date to work from. Uh, the big change for the fourth grant is that it will take into account profits for the 2019-2020 tax year. Um, 
This is a good thing because it means those who were self-employed and only started self-employment in 2019-2020 will now be eligible for this grant. Previously, they weren't eligible for the first three grants. Uh, there are some bad news, though. Um, if your income has changed in the 1920 year um, and you fall foul of any of the restrictions that are, are, are in place on this grant, you could well find that actually the level of your grant reduces or, or in fact, you're not entitled to a grant at all. Um, but again, notification will come forward to you in April of this year to, um, to offer you entitlement to it. If you're concerned that you haven't received that, certainly speak to us and we can establish whether you have uh, any changes in entitlement. The next slide uh, shows the fifth and final grant that will now become available. Um, this will become available in mid-July and it will cover a five-month period, not a three-month period, um, from May to September um, when this is anticipated to be the final self-employed income support grant. Um, the basis upon which this grant will be calculated will change um, from a level of profit to a turnover test. Um, and it looks at the, the, the way in which your turnover has changed uh, in the tax year 2021. Um, if your turnover has fallen by more than 30%, then the basis of calculation of the grant will be the same as in previous years, uh, based on 80% of uh, your profits for the, a three month period. However, if your turnover has fallen by less than 30%, then that 80% figure will be exchanged for a 30% figure. So reducing the amount of the grant that you'll be entitled to receive uh, for the final grant period. Uh, this is obviously, this change is obviously supposed to target businesses that have been slower to recover um, uh, and, and hopefully it, it will be commensurate with the, the drop off in profits that those have experienced. One final slide on the self-employed income support grant. Um, if we can change over the slide, please. Thank you. Um, grants made after the 6th of April 2021 will now be taxed in the year of receipt. So previous legislation said that all self-employed income support grant grants would be taxable in the, the, the 2021 tax year because they've extended the, uh, the grant scheme for a fourth and fifth grant, they brought in legislation to say that the fourth and fifth grants will be taxable in the 2021-22 tax year. At the same time, also, they brought in legislation which will allow the revenue to recover the full amount of a grant where they believe that you have falsely or inappropriately claimed that grant. So they have the ability to recover all of the tax where they believe that you've, uh, sorry, all of the grant where they believe that you have, uh, uh, have made an error or have falsely recovered that amount. It's worth noting also that there's, no, there's new loan funding available uh, that replaces the, the Sybil and the uh, bounce back loans that will come in from the 6th of April 2021. It's called the Recovery Loan Scheme, which allows uh, businesses to borrow between £25,000 and up to £10 million um, to be used for uh, recovery from the pandemic. Um, the appropriate bankers will be in place to be able to, to, to support those. Um, and at this stage, we have early details, but it's anticipated um, that there will be a, a, a security scheme in place to allow businesses to be able to borrow additional funds to be able to grow out of the pandemic. Okay, if we can turn now to look at other specific areas of tax support that's been offered by the government. Uh, one of the key industries uh, in the UK is that of construction and housing. Uh, this sector I know fought hard to reopen in June, July last year uh, and received some support from the government in terms of a reduction in land and buildings transaction tax or, or uh, SDLT uh, south, of the, south of the border in the rest of the UK, uh, which increased the nil rate band before these duties became payable. Um, the next slide illustrates how these changes and reliefs have been extended. So for the rest of the UK, not Scotland, uh, I'm afraid, um, the nil rate band, which was set at £500,000 uh, back in July 2020, uh, was due to end on the 31st of 
March 2021. Uh, this has now been extended to the 30th of June 2021, um, where after that it will drop down to £250,000 until September 2021. Um, and then uh, from the 1st of October 2021, it will return to the pre-pandemic level of nil rate band of £125,000. For Scotland, however, on the next slide, um, they have they, they they had to increase the nil rate band uh, from 145,000 to 250,000 pounds back in July last year. Uh, but Kate Forbes announced yesterday that they would not be following uh, Mr. Sunak's suit there in terms of extending that beyond the 31st of March 2021. So from the 1st of April 2021. Um, the nil rate band for Scottish land and buildings transaction tax will now return £245,000. Next slide, we look at some of the measures that uh, were introduced to help on VAT. Um, the government offered uh, deferral schemes for payment of VAT uh, and reductions in rates of VAT in particularly hard hit sectors. Uh, but what other changes came in? Well, in reality, there were no other changes. What the government announced today is that the standard rate of VAT will, will stay at 20% and the registration thresholds will hold firm at, at uh, £85,000 with the deregistration thresholds also staying the same at £83,000. Um, th this is fiscal drag, as, a, as I've talked about before, or a stealth tax by another name. Um, the registration thresholds haven't changed uh, since 2017. So if we were basing these on inflation, the registration threshold should in fact be £93,000. And HM Revenue and Customs anticipate um, that because these thresholds will now remain in place until at least 2024, um, they anticipate another 19,000 extra businesses will now need to register for VAT over the next three years. So again, we see by doing nothing, the Treasury will collect additional taxes here. The next sl slide does look at uh, one of the changes that occurred over the last year and how this has now been extended in the budget. Um, for the first time since 2000, um, sorry, 1979, the UK will now have four rates of VAT for a period, 0%, 5%, 12.5% and 20% who said this would be a simple tax. Um, so for the hospitality sector, though, this is a welcome change. Uh, this was introduced back in uh, July of last year, a reduction in the rate of VAT for the hospitality sector uh, to 5%. Uh, Sunak has announced that this 5% will continue until September 2021, uh, where it will drop for a further six months to 12.5% before uh, returning to the normal rate of VAT at 20%. So welcome reduction for those that are involved in food, non-alcoholic drinks, accommodation and, and tourist attraction uh, sectors as they try to get themselves back up on their feet. The next slide looks at some of the, the, the VAT deferral scheme that was put in place back in March last year, where the government announced that um, if UK VAT registered businesses chose to, they could defer paying VAT that was due between the period March to June 2020. Uh, this, these amounts uh, initially were all to become payable on the 31st of March 2021. Uh, however, you can now spread those uh, this uh, payment uh, over an 11 month period. Um, that 11 month period can begin from March 2021 uh, with no interest or penalty cost applying. Uh, but you do need to apply for this deferral uh, by the 31st of March 2021 and certainly to opt into the scheme to make sure you can take advantage of it. So something if you're still sitting on VAT that's to be paid, uh, you should consider this month. Okay, so that's everything I want to cover on VAT. Um, if we can skip on to pensions at this stage. Uh, pension tax relief is always a, a big issue in budgets, um, but I'm afraid once more we've seen no changes here. Annual allowance has uh, fixed at £40,000, same as in previous year. The one change is that they've frozen the lifetime allowance. 
to at 1,073,100. Lifetime allowance is the maximum amount you can have in your pension scheme uh, before additional tax liabilities are levied on the scheme as you withdraw funds from that. It, it, it's now been agreed that this amount will be fixed until 2026. Um, so a significant period of freezing of this, which is likely to result in additional taxpayers uh, uh, paying additional monies uh, as they start to draw funds from their uh, pension funds. Next slide looks at um, investments. Uh, and you would think that um, uh, we've all become savers uh, during the pandemic. Uh, Pre-pandemic, it was anticipated that uh, our household income uh, to savings or our savings to household income stood at about 7%. During 2020, this increased to about 16%, and it's anticipated to reduce to about 11% from 2021, um, indicating that we've all become better at saving over this period. Um, not sure this is what the government want to hear, though, um, because post lockdown, they want us to get out there uh, and rebuild the consumer uh, based economy that we had before that. And this maybe explains why they haven't changed any of the savings limits that are available there. We still have the individual savings accounts, but the maximum amount that you can pay in there um, is fixed at £20,000 per annum uh, for tax-free savings, with the junior riser for those under 18 years of age still holding firm at £9,000. OK, quickly looking at the capital taxes, uh, and the first of these is capital gains tax. Uh, Pre-budget, this was being trailed as an area of significant change, um, but I'm afraid we haven't seen anything here other than, again, a freezing of the annual exemption. Uh, the annual exemption being the amount that you can um, incur again before you pay any rates of capital gains tax. And again, the Chancellor has announced that the annual exemption will be frozen at £12,300 until 2026. Um, we are expecting to see further papers on changes to capital gains tax, and we'll touch on that further shortly. The second of the capital taxes, inheritance tax, is also one that is regularly receives attention. Uh, however, it's not a big earner um, from a tax point of view, and not one that is particularly popular uh, with the Tory party for changes. So again, we can see here there've been no significant changes to inheritance tax uh, in this budget. Um, they've frozen the no rate band, the amount of an estate, um, uh, the amount an estate gets to before it has to start to pay death rates of 40% at £325,000. Uh, and they've indicated that this will remain at this level also until April 2026. Uh, interesting, this £325,000 um, has been around since 2009, hasn't changed since then. So effectively, we're going to have to 17 years of no change uh, to this allowance by the time we get to 2026. Uh, we've obviously got the full residential no rate band of £175,000 uh, for those that have residential property, effectively meaning that an individual now has a no rate band of half a million pounds uh, on death if they own property. Okay, um, final one, uh, which I'll briefly touch on is IR35. I'm sure you regularly hear me talking about IR35 in budgets before. Um, this is probably going to be the swan song of it. Um, after years of the revenue failure to tackle um, perceived uh, avoidance here, and then delays in them introducing um, the legislation, we finally got from April 2020 off payroll working legislation in place. Um, shifting the responsibility for operating the appropriate tax on contractors um, to um, individuals, uh, to the effectively the employer or the person who's carrying out the contracting. Um, there are exemptions for organisations that have got less than 50 employees, um, but the, this is basically coming in from now. If you are concerned about this, certainly speak to us or um, use the Inland Revenue Checker there to check the status of the people that you have there. Okay, so finally, can I wrap up by looking at what might be to come? Um, we started off this presentation uh, by uh, looking at uh, the, the black hole that exists in terms of the budget. Where will Mr Sunak look at to raise taxes? 
Well, if we can have a quick look at two or three of these areas. The first area is the levelling of the playing field between employees and the self-employed. Um, uh, he has indicated that he has concerns that the self-employed uh, receive far too generous uh, a, 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 an approach to taxation with reduced national insurance contributions and generous deductions for expenses there. Uh, so that could be one area. The second one is always pension tax relief. Um, uh, the withdrawal of higher rate tax relief on pension contributions, possibly moving to a flat rate of pension contributions, uh, tax relief could be in the future. The one that's probably um, most attracted attention though is capital gains tax reforms. Um, the Office of Tax Simplification have uh, lodged reports uh, with the Treasury on what they believe should be the main changes and reforms that are uh, capital gains tax required. Um, some of those are listed here, particularly aligning the rates of income tax and capital gains tax. Um, they believe that if all of their proposals were implemented, this would change capital gains tax from being a £10 billion a year revenue earner to almost a £44 billion a year uh, revenue earner. Um, so th those changes there, I'll not go through in detail. Probably one uh, of most interest for many businesses is the final one, uh, changes to the business asset um, position, um, where we've had a fairly generous entrepreneur's relief provision for a number of years. Um, they've made recommendations there that they'll need to increase the minimum shareholding from 5 to 25%, uh, increase the length of time that you need to hold the asset, and introduce an age limit. So returning, for those of you who can remember it, to a more retirement relief provision. The final one we want to, to the, of the taxes that we've mentioned already is inheritance tax reforms. Uh, and again, that same Office of Tax Simplification have indicated that uh, the recommendations there, um, which could mean that in the coming years we see a significant reform to inheritance tax uh, over this period. And here are some of the indications of uh, the changes that could be around, coming around the corner. And finally, uh, probably one that's more off the wall, is a wealth tax, um, a one-off tax that um, the Wealth Commission anticipate could raise over 200 billion pounds worth of revenue over a five year period if it was introduced uh, as effectively a golden bullet to try and solve the, the pandemic debt issues. Um, Mr Sunak is on record to say he's not a fan of this, it doesn't really follow Tory party principles, but we'll just have to wait and see whether it, it becomes attractive to him. Um, so I think that's everything I want to cover today. Um, uh, at this stage, uh, I'm going to pass you over to Andrew uh, for a wrap-up. Thank you.